Now then, throughout the darkest days of the recession, Gordon Brown repeated one mantra. This was a global recession, he said, happening in every country, in every continent. So are we now seeing a global recovery? Or are some countries finding it harder to escape from the downturn than others? Joining us now to discuss that are three writers on the economic crisis in different parts of the world. Nambisa Moyo, author of How the West Was Lost, about China's increasing economic dominance. Also, Will Hutton from the Work Foundation, author of The World We're In, and more recently, them and us. And Matthew Lynn, who's also written a new book entitled Bust, Greece, the Euro and the Sovereign Debt Crisis. Very good morning to you all. If I could start with you, um, Dambi Samoyo. Is the future of the West relatively bleak? What we're seeing here is a, is a stuttering recovery for the West, while the emerging economies, particularly those in the East, steam ahead, eventually leaving us behind. Well, I think the fundamental premise of, uh, premise of my book is that the Western countries have a chance to turn things around. I mean, as they are right now, you're absolutely right. They're still sitting on massive deficits, um, huge debts, and heavy unemployment, as we know. Um, but, you know, if you're asking me, will China continue to uh, grow? Yes. Uh, will China grow faster than the European and American economies? Yes. Um, but we still don't know whether, on a relative basis, China will be able to converge to the, you know, the per capita income basis of the U.S. or Europe. But and does I think the West remain in this recovery phase? Does it remain dependent on those assets that China has amassed in terms of its foreign exchange reserves as it goes around buying up the difficult bond sales, buying up the assets, buying up the resources? Well, I think we'll come to that in a minute, I imagine, with the sovereign, uh, sovereign debt crisis yeah. in Europe. But, I mean, fundamentally, you know, whether we stay in this, in this crisis or this situation depends on policymakers. Um, I mean, the book essentially argues that the last 50 years um, has been a catastrophic policy era uh, in the sense that um, governments have in instituted policies that we're now actually feeling the pains of. Things like pensions, things like the subprime crisis, which are largely born of um, very good intentions but bad implementation of policy. So, Will Hutton, I mean, the chickens are, are coming home to roost. Is there a way out? Look, the aftermath of credit crunches are bad news. I mean, uh, every time there's been a credit crunch in history, it's taken, on average, six, seven years to get out of it. And what this credit, what's different about this credit crunch is it happens simultaneously in Britain, America, and in parts of Europe. Um, you know, Spain uh, badly hit by 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 debt and credit, just like um, uh, Ireland, and everyone knows the names. And it's, it's going to take six, seven years to get out of, and that's going to mean slow growth um, in the inverted commas old West, and it means that the rest of the world, and um, particularly you know the China and India, are going to look good. But I want to echo what Dan Beasley said, because I, and I, from a slightly different point of view, I mean, I'm not, and I don't buy you know, this notion that uh, the future is Asian and, uh, and the West is screwed in the long term. Um, if, you, if you look at, if you look, if you take a 50 or 100 year view of Western capitalism, uh, it is the great technological uh, scientific jumps that have, that have driven um, world growth. And that's going to accelerate. In the next 50, 60, 70 years, we're going to see more innovation of that type than the last 250 years combined. And my money is on the West to be the place where most of that happens. Okay. So I think incomes are going to, the, the, uh, there's not going to be a closure between per capita incomes in Asia and the West. Actually, the story is going to be widening gap. Okay, well, you need to come back on that to be yeah. some, but I want to see where Matthew Lynn stands. <coughs> um, is, uh, Will, Will's erudite <laughs> summation, <laughs> summation <laughs> just the whole, the whole of the next century. century. Yeah, the I'll future is Chinese uh, and the West <laughs> is screwed. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, but I'll come back to Will's point in a moment. I mean, just to pick up on what Dan Bizzard was saying, I mean, one, one of the things I explore in, in the book on the sovereign debt crisis and it relates to the euro is I think it's interesting to pick up on what she was just touching on there. I think, uh, you know, for the last 20 years or so in most of Europe, and it's true of the US as well, we've had very stagnant productivity, we've had stagnant real incomes, and we kind of masked that with debt. We took on more and more debt uh, on the personal sector. We saw it in the subprime crisis, and that's actually part of the backdrop to the eurozone crisis. It's got peculiarities because of the single currency and the way the single currency interacts with all of that debt. But the backdrop of it is that people haven't been getting richer. They're being outstripped by people uh, in Asia. They've been competing for jobs with people in Asia. And we, we've compensated for, by, for that just by borrowing more and more at the personal level and at the government level. And I think that's stopped. I think the sovereign debt but, crisis but, 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 but is, is a full stop on that. I think the credit crunch was a full stop on personal debt. But and certainly sovereign the developed debt economies in the West, has it stopped for good? Do we have to get used to a different era? Are we in another phase? Well, I think, I think what's stopped for good is, is, is disguising our problems with debt. I mean, I think the credit, as I just said a moment ago, the credit crunch was you couldn't just borrow 
on a personal level. You couldn't just take, you know, remortgage a house, the kind of stuff we know everyone was doing uh, to take on more debt, and, and the kind of stuff that governments do. If you look at the figures, it's very interesting. I mean, governments have been borrowing more and more on a steady basis for about 30 years, and politicians have been reluctant to raise enough in taxes uh, to pay for the kind of spending that they did. And we saw that in the last Is that 10 right, years. Matthew, yeah, it's absolutely. You can look at. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's I'll send you a copy of the book. Will they that's have? It's in the US, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's true in the US, but it's true. It's, it's true in the UK. I'm not sure it's the story so much in the UK. I mean, debt levels uh, were falling. Well, the, the, the debt, How many debt levels were falling in the UK. Well, they, well, no, not if you get not if you go back historically across the whole of, the whole of Europe. Be, there's been a general increase. Uh, in the level of public debt as a percentage of GDP. I mean, it depends. It was a very big spike. You've got, you got to look at the figures correctly. There was a huge spike after World War II because there was a small matter of defeating the Nazis yeah, and all that kind of stuff. We know about it. But then it came way back down. So you can fiddle the figures by saying, oh, it was 300% or whatever it was okay, after World let, War II. Let, but there's let, been a general let, increase let's in let's government debt. Let's get back debt. to Dan, Dan yeah. analysis. I mean, I mean, there is, it's not entirely bleak for the West. There is still time. Yes, there is still time, but just specific on this point of public debt, um, I think the concern, of course, you know, the book is talking about what's happened in the 50, past 50 years, but also what's going to be happening. And there's still, still the IMF forecast for public debt for the UK, for the US, it shows it rising. And a lot of that, um, and, and again, in terms of uh, structural issues, as opposed to the tactical deficit management that everybody's focused on, is around things like pensions, it's around things like um, health care costs that I feel are not really being addressed. I think everybody, we've been sort of sort of gotten used to kicking it forward, somebody else is going to deal with it in the future. Well, actually, you know what, the time has now come when we have to contend with these issues. Mm -hmm. And some of the statistics um, that are coming out around uh, popular, I mean, we know the demographics, first of all, but just around the, the health care costs and the pension costs, which nobody really wants to talk about. Sure. We, it's very hard for us to understand well, what, exactly what those liabilities well, look well, like. How, how does your relatively benign scenario come about with those great drags well, on growth? It's pretty, I mean, it's relatively benign. I mean, I think the next six, seven years for countries like Britain in America are going to be very tough. Um, but I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, is that if you take a kind of 25 or 30 year view, you know, the great driver of growth is in the end, and it drives through issues like pensions actually, um, are the great step changes in technology. I mean, you know, you look at the 20th century, it was the arrival of the computer, the internal combustion engine, um, you know, the wonderful things that happened with, uh, uh, with transportation. I and mean, these things were you know, really lifting growth. Now, the, the pace of those is going to accelerate in the 21st century. I mean, in the next 30, 40, 50 years, um, the scale of change is just going to be unbelievable, devastating. And it will be Western economies where most of that is captured. It'll come out of Western universities, Western laboratories, Western companies, because it's so difficult but, but, to construct but, the infrastructure but, to do but, that. Really, don't we just assume that uh, from the Far East, you know, they've got lots of people and they make cheap things? That's not the case, is it, anymore? Well, they, no, they, no, they, but, even uh, their education systems are way ahead of ours well, in, 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 in terms of the achievements, point, in terms of the outcomes. That, that it. Look, I mean, if you patenting, I mean, one of the things that you like, we look at when looking at international competitiveness in these issues is the TRIDIC patent, the patents that are lodged simultaneously in Europe, the United States, and in Japan, the three major areas. Now, you know, of those patents, China at the moment does 0.1% of the world's patents that are lodged in those three areas. Uh, as a hotbed of innovation, it okay. isn't at the races. And the same story is true of India, actually. It's going to take them a long time, long you're, time. You'll take, you'll just take, take on that, please. Well, Dennis. I would just say that um, I think I'm, less, I'm certainly less sanguine because if you just uh, sort of follow through with Will's logic, which I, I do subscribe that, you know, for the foreseeable future, we will see innovation continue to be done in places in, like Silicon Valley in the United States and, and, and parts of Europe. But the problem is those gains will accrue to a relatively small proportion of educated people in those countries. That's Structurally, true. we've just spent 50 years of, of education. We just look at the statistics from the OECD, the PISA reports, in terms of mathematics and science in Europe, the UK, and the United States. These have been on the massive decline. And well. so well, I, 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 how I, I, I do you then? I want to relate this, though, to, to the issue of debt, because what we're talking about is, is investment, investment in people, investment in technologies. Where does the, the money come from, Matthew Lynn? If we're so in the West, so burdened with, with with debt, which it seems you describe will take take years, decades to work through. Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to, it's going to be very tough. I mean, you know, I mean, I agree with some, some some of Will's points. You can't write off the West; it's still very very innovative. Still got lots of clever people uh, and, and lots and lots of good companies. But it is burd it is overburdened down by debt, and it's got it's got to it's got to start balancing the books. It's got to get its financial house in order before it can start growing again. So have so we got the rest of the world? It's not. I mean, this notion that I mean, I and I do think I do agree with you. I agree with the big point you're making that actually 
there's um, that there's too there's been too much private credit as much as public debt. I mean, my God, but I mean it's not as if it's not as if places like China or uh, it's kind of unencumbered by private debt. I mean, I think the Chinese banking system is much more rickety actually than the Western okay, banking well, system. We don't really know that. Yeah, 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 I mean, you may well be right, but no one really they don't really publish honest yeah. figures. So and, we and this, the this is a problem. It. You know, this, right. the idea is just for the West. I think is actually analytically incorrect. Just one last thought from you, you all, because uh, we are nearly out of time. Danby, how do we? get out of this? How do we change? It's changing the mindset. Mm -hmm. I think fundamentally we've got to stop focusing only on tactical issues. The short term, yeah. as I said, things like deficits, they're all super important. But the real things that are going to cause the big unwind in these economies are the longer term structure problems like education, infrastructure, energy efficiency, and those type of issues. And unfortunately, the political cycles do not lend um, for ah. politicians to focus on those issues. They are rewarded for focusing on the tactical, uh, 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 not the structure. And you get the last word, Matthew Lynn. Uh, are, are we getting Unfair. out of this mindset? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not much side of it, yes. No, we've got, we, but we've got, to get, we've got to get off addiction to easy credit. That's for the personal sector and the corporate sector of leverage buyouts, all that kind of stuff. And of course, the government sector has got, has got to get out of this idea you can always borrow your way out of problems. Time has flown by, uh, Matthew Lynn. Will Hutton, thank you very much indeed. I'll bear in mind your uh, summation of the world economy. <laughs> Dampy Samoyer, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thanks. Who needs to write books? <laughs> <laughs>